this uh, short uh, presentation, uh, I'm going to not go into that much detail into the into the physics and to the technology uh, uh, portion of it, but uh, just showcase some uh, interesting uh, historical cases and uh, a, a little bit of um, uh, stuff to to for you to to visualize uh, some some aspects of uh, uh, emotional intelligence and but essentially uh, mainly. Uh, we are going to. Uh, 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 we, I'm going to show you about uh, language, speech, uh, because it is important. Uh, one of the most important, as Melissa said, uh, you need to uh, be able to first understand, have the, the emotional intelligence to understand what's happening to you and to people around you, and then you need to be able to express uh, this uh, to your peers and uh, then steadily building up to music uh, because uh, music uh, triggers all sorts of emotions to everyone different types of music and uh, uh, there's going to be a couple of videos and uh, some uh, uh, interacting questions and some fun facts about the brain so uh, here we go this is the brain activity Essentially, the title is Introduction to Neuroimaging and Functional Imaging of the Brain with MRI, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Uh, so, first off, uh, the building blocks of the brain are what is known, what are known as neurons, uh, also known as nerve cells. So, um, here is an example of, oh, let me put the laser pointer. So, this over here, is an example of a neuron. It comprises three main parts. The first part over here is the cell body with the nucleus of the cell in the center. Then there is the neuraxon and then there are the axon tips. So essentially this neuron gets plugged in, the, 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 the end of the neuron gets plugged in to the beginning of the next neuron and essentially, and the beginning of the first neuron is get connect, it's connected to the end of the previous neuron. So uh, with this way, uh, electrical signal, uh, as we all know, uh, that brain uh, uses electrical signals to, to uh, command the various uh, parts of the body. And uh, the signal gen is generated in the, uh, neuro in the, in the neuron uh, cell body. It, it gets propagated through the new axon and to the axon tips and from there to the next neuron and so on. For example, if one wants to move his her hand, uh, then uh, and the brain hat that you that you created earlier, uh, for example, in the sensory motor areas, uh, this is where the signal is generated and then it gets propagated through the brain, through the spine and to the hand or uh, finger or toe or whatever. Uh, so. Uh, here on, on the uh, right hand side, uh, we can see two examples of neurons. Uh, they are the same neurons, uh, but with one distinct uh, difference. Uh, the, the, the neuron on the right uh, has these little compartments here. Uh, these little compartments, as you can see, help. They act as insulators and they help to the electrical signal to get propagated faster from one end to the other and from one neuron to the next. Uh, in comparison, when when these compartments known as myelin, this material is known as myelin, is not present, then what happens? Uh, the signal does not propagate as fast or sometimes doesn't even propagate at all. So uh, <clears throat> this is the main uh, entity uh, that comprises that, that the brain comprises of so essentially let me just go to the next one uh, over here this is one neuron again this is the center the the body this is the neuraxon and these are the tips the axon tips this is another neuron this is the head this is the uh, axon and these here are the axon tips and uh, this is uh, the the myelin sheath uh, the insulator, as we said. Uh, in the brain overall, though, there are not only one type of, of nerve cells, there are multiple cells. Uh, for example, the microglia, the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, 
and uh, of course uh, forgot to mention the synapse uh, let me go back to the previous slide the synapse over here is at the interface between one neuron's axon tips and the other neuron's uh, cell body this interface between them the connections between them are known as synapses so uh, when you take a portion of the brain uh, all of these types of cells are present. And of course, there are many different types of diseases associated with the brain, which are um, uh, due to damage to, to some of the, the different types of neurons. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about the neuronal development. And this slide, okay, I know uh, it might look daunting, but it's the only slide with so many uh, words on it, but it's uh, it's important. So uh, essentially, there are five main uh, stages of neuronal development. Uh, when uh, some of them begin from when uh, when the the fetus is in uh, its mother's belly, and uh, some uh, progress through uh, even uh, early adulthood. So. Uh, for example, the first thing that happens is neurogenesis. Uh, the neurons are being uh, developed, they're being created. Uh, then there's the neural migration. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, this means that essentially when, for example, uh, a, a child uh, shows a particular talent in, let's say, playing a musical instrument, uh, and uh, the child engages in training of uh, such a musical instrument, for example, then the brain sort of rearranges the neurons in such a way as to enhance the, the child's ability to, to, to play the instrument better. It's essentially what we uh, say, what we call talent, is essentially a, a byproduct of uh, these processes and especially neural migration. Uh, myelination is, uh, is the process of uh, developing this myelin sheath uh, that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, which aids with signal propagation. Then, of course, there's also a process known as pruning, uh, wherein, uh, let's say, uh, we have a person who is very good at maths. Uh, but uh, that person that's very good at maths does not care about, let's say, language uh, or let's say does not care about music. Then what happens is the brain realizes that some portions of it uh, are not as uh, useful to the person as others. So what happens is uh, the brain steadily uh, uh, re refines the, the circuitry and uh, destroys some, uh, eliminates the weak synapses and strength, further strengthens the strong ones. So the combination of neural migration and pruning uh, is uh, essentially leads to, you know, what we say, uh, talent, essentially. And of course, there's synaptogenesis. It's a process of forming new synapses. Uh, I'm not going to stay much longer into this one. So this is the question for you. Uh, what neuronal development process is responsible for rearranging neurons in the brain of children and young adults? It's based on the previous slide. I see many questions on neurogenesis and many answers, excuse me. Many answers on pruning. Neurogenesis gets higher and higher. Okay. Uh, I, I want you to remember that neurogenesis is the process of generating, of creating new neurons. It's not responsible for rearranging existing neurons. Okay, so the correct answer was uh, neural migration, and uh, <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, you might worry. not get more answers. <laughs> I think this one is the, is the, the most difficult uh, question in the in the session. Here we're going to see a video 
a short one. It's about uh, well, we don't have to see all of it. Uh, it's about a four-year-old uh, child uh, who is a, a virtuoso in in piano. Can you hear? Yes. Perfect. Sounds of something. Sounds of something. Oh, get long, 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 So uh, let's not uh, waste any more time on this. Uh, this child is amazing at the piano. Essentially, you can hear that. Uh, what I wanted to emphasize here is that uh, people uh, do not get born with uh, talent, let's say, for something. But uh, what happens is the processes that they uh, we talked about earlier. So essentially, for this child to be able to play at such a high level uh, piano, uh, pruning has happened. Of course, myelination has happened. The signals get propagated very fast. Uh, much, uh, plenty of uh, new synapses have been uh, developed. Uh, pruning has happened to parts of the brain that are not very much used for this process. And of course, neural migration is the most uh, important one. Uh, the brain has redirected all of its focus essentially into strengthening this uh, particular skill, playing the piano. And uh, as we're going to see uh, later on at the, at the final video of this uh, presentation, uh, well, actually, I'm, I, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to leave it to be explained uh, by the video. It's very self-explained, self-explanatory. Okay, so a question for you. Uh, we talked about neurons and nerve cells. When placed one uh, on top of the, not on top, uh, end to end. Okay. Uh, what's the approximate of the length? Okay, we have a variety of answers already. 10, 150,000 kilometers is the most prominent question. Let me just uh, emphasize that 880 meters is the length of 450 humans placed one on top of each other, just so that you know. And on the other hand, 150,000 kilometers is halfway the distance of Earth to the Moon. Okay, I didn't manage to influence you by this comment and you keep selecting 150,000 kilometers. Well done, this is the correct answer as well. Uh, actually, yes, that it is, that is correct. Approximately 150,000 kilometers is the length of uh, when you decompose the brain and we take each individual neuron and place it one uh, next to the other, then this is the entire length. So very good. Now let's move on to the human brain. Uh, actually, you have now created your own brain hat, so you, uh, you are considered experts by now, so I don't think I can uh, I have anything more to add by this one side here. Just, uh, just a small fun fact, this little brain area here, well, the pons essentially. Uh, this is the part of the brain stem which connects essentially the brain to the spine. But this little uh, bit here, the pons, is what is responsible, although not directly responsible to emotional intelligence, it uh, what uh, disables you from moving when you are asleep. So when you have a dream that you are running or flying or something, uh, the reason why you don't move while you are asleep that much and you don't act on your dreams is this little uh, portion of the brain here, the pons. So moving on to the next slide. How much do you think the average human brain weighs? 
14 kilograms, 140 grams, 1400 kilograms, or 1.4 kilograms, approximately. Sorry, Dimos, I changed this question a tiny bit. So it's just an either or actually 1.4 okay. kilograms or 2.8. Okay, okay, not a problem. 1.4 or 2.8. Perfect. 45. 46 of you chose the correct answer is 1.4 kilogram approximately from 1.3 to 1.5 essentially. So it's very good. You know your stuff already. You are almost neuroscientist. So good for you. Perfect. So now let's move on to my favorite part. Uh, the human brain as seen on MRI. So this is an MRI machine. This is one of uh, our uh, best uh, three Tesla MRI machines that uh, as a company we produce. Uh, it's known as a G Signa Premier. It's very powerful and uh, we can obtain high resolution images of the brain. Uh, so here is what is known as an axial slice of the brain. So uh, what do we mean by slices uh, in uh, neuroimaging? Uh, we do not, uh, excuse me, we do not obtain a, a, an entire uh, image of the entire brain, but we, we go slice by slice. So depending on how you take the slices, you can have either a coronal, a sagittal or an axial. axial. Uh, so essentially, when uh, you consider the, 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 the patient sitting uh, like this into the scanner and then the axial slices are like this. So cut like this is what we see here in the screen. Uh, all the white bits here, but you can see the white ones. This is the white matter. And all the gray ones is the gray matter. So what is white matter and what is gray matter? Remember earlier, let me go back to the slide with the ne neurons. So uh, this here, the neuroxons of actually here, neuroxons are the collection of neuroxons comprise the white matter. And then the collection of, of uh, brain uh, of uh, uh, nerve cell bodies, they comprise the gray matter. So here, let me go back. Essentially, everything here, the gray, is gray matter and are the, the centers of the brain. And uh, the white matter connects the various uh, uh, brain areas. So, uh, this is one important structure. It's called the, the midbrain and it's shaped like a heart or uh, like a Mickey Mouse ears or something. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of the cerebellum that you remember with the fine motor skills from your uh, head brain hub. And uh, essentially, this is this is the sagittal view, and perpendicular to the sagittal view of the brain is the axial view over here. So now let's move on uh, to a question. Let's say that uh, you are a doctor, and uh, a patient presents to you, and he tells you this sentence. You know that Smoodle Pinker, then that I want to get him round and take care of him like you want before. Does this patient have brain damage? And if so, where do you think? Oh, nice. Okay, so yes, in the speech place. Okay, bad language. His eyes. My brain is damaged. Okay, this is not good. It's about a hypothetical patient, but okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Temporal lobe. Oral brain, temporal lobe, on the temporal lobe, I don't know personally. It is fumbled up. Yep, uh, you're right. Okay, so essentially, yes, uh, most of you got it right. Uh, it's, uh, well, temporal lobe, it, it, it's a brain. Uh, well, someone said, I don't have a brain, but you do have a brain. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the temporal lobe, the lobes are, are, are large structures. Lobes essentially, like uh, the frontal lobe, they are a collection of, of uh, brain areas. So, uh, the correct answer to this question is yes, it is damage to the language areas. Another patient comes in and he says, Book, book, two table. Does the patient have brain damage? And if so, where? 
you don't have to be uh, limited to these four four answers. Uh, I think you can just say anything you want. You are now experts in uh, brain imaging. What is this? Yes, in the broadcast. Oh, we have someone very, very knowledgeable. Someone already knows where I'm going with this. Hello, Francisco and Veronica. Okay, hello. Uh, top language. Yes, language, temporal lobe to language areas. Yes, correct. Very good. Nice. The first patient. Uh, has damage with the press with the sentence, you know that smoothly pinker than that I want to get him round and take care of him like you want before. So there are two, there were two doctors around 120 years ago. One was Dr. Wernicke and the other one was Dr. Broca. Uh, these hypothetical patients uh, were actual patients and uh, they each had trauma. Uh, to these parts of the brain, one had the, this patient here who, who created this sentence had damage somewhere here in the brain. And the patient uh, who said book, book, two table had damage in this part of the brain. So uh, land, these are two language networks, essentially. One is uh, associated with the production of speech and the other is associated with the understanding of speech. So this person here suffering with damage in the Wernicke's area known as Wernicke's aphasia, he cannot, he or she, uh, cannot produce meaningful sentences. Uh, they, 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 they don't make sense. I mean, what, what's the point of this? It doesn't make sense. On the other hand, uh, on this, uh, when you have damage on the Broca's area, like someone correctly uh, also answered in the previous question. Uh, this person understands what he wants to say, what he, she wants to say, but he, uh, he, she cannot produce speech. For example, instead of saying there are two books on the table, uh, he, she said book, book, two table. Or instead of saying, I will take the dog for a walk, he, she will say walk dog. So he understands, but he cannot produce, he, she cannot produce speech. And, um, Essentially, now we're moving on to the to the last part. It's a human brain with fMRI. So fMRI means functional magnetic resonance imaging. What does this mean? Uh, we know that when we do something, for example, when we move our hands or when we uh, close our fist or when we finger tap or uh, anything, anything, absolutely anything that, that we do, the brain requires fuel for this and uh, the brain's fuel is essentially uh, blood and oxygen. So uh, by, by setting up specific experiments with the patients inside the MRI scanner, uh, we can uh, identify the functional areas of the brain, which is very useful in case the patient needs to have some surgery. So the neurosurgeon knows where not to operate. Uh, for example, um, to delineate the centers of speech, uh, we can tell uh, the patient to say some opposite words. For example, we say uh, to him through the microphone, let's say black, he says, he, she say white, the patient says white, tall, short, uh, fat, slim, uh, what else, uh, foreign, native, and all those sorts of stuff. Or we can uh, ask the patient to do some, some task about the, the, the motor networks. So uh, by doing these paradigms, we can end up with real life a depiction of the various functional areas. And let's look at this last video, uh, which is amazing, and it will uh, help you gain a better understanding of how actually uh, does uh, music and playing a musical instrument. Did you know that every time musicians pick up their instruments, there are fireworks going off all over their brain? 
On the outside, they may look calm and focused, reading the music and making the precise and practice movements required. But inside their brains, there's a party going on. How do we know this? Well, in the last few decades, neuroscientists have made enormous breakthroughs in understanding how our brains work by monitoring them in real time with instruments like fMRI and PET scanners. When people are hooked up to these machines, tasks such as reading or doing math problems each have corresponding areas of the brain where activity can be observed. But when researchers got the participants to listen to music, they saw fireworks. Multiple areas of their brains were lighting up at once as they processed the sound, took it apart to understand elements like melody and rhythm, and then put it all back together into unified musical experience. And our brains do all this work in the split second between when we first hear the music and when our foot starts to tap along. But when scientists turn from observing the brains of music listeners to those of musicians, the little backyard fireworks became a jubilee. It turns out that while listening to music engages the brain in some pretty interesting activities, playing music is the brain's equivalent of a full-body workout. The neuroscientists saw multiple areas of the brain light up, simultaneously processing different information in intricate, interrelated, and astonishingly fast sequences. But what is it about making music that sets the brain alight? The research is still fairly new, but neuroscientists have a pretty good idea. Playing a musical instrument engages practically every area of the brain at once, especially the visual, auditory, and motor cortices. And as with any other workout, disciplined, structured practice in playing music strengthens those brain functions, allowing us to apply that strength to other activities. The most obvious difference between listening to music and playing it is that the latter requires fine motor skills, which are controlled in both hemispheres of the brain. It also combines the linguistic and mathematical precision in which the left hemisphere is more involved with the novel and creative content that the right excels in. For these reasons, playing music has been found to increase the volume and activity in the brain's corpus callosum, the bridge between the two hemispheres, allowing messages to get across the brain faster and through more diverse routes. This may allow musicians to solve problems more effectively and creatively in both academic and social settings. Because making music also involves crafting and understanding its emotional content and message, musicians often have higher levels of executive function, a category of interlinked tasks that includes planning, strategizing, and attention to detail, and requires simultaneous analysis of both cognitive and emotional aspects. This ability also has an impact on how our memory systems work. And indeed, musicians exhibit enhanced memory functions, creating, storing, and retrieving memories more quickly and efficiently. Studies have found that musicians appear to use their highly connected brains to give each memory multiple tags, such as a conceptual tag, an emotional tag, an audio tag, and a contextual tag, like a good internet search engine. So how do we know that all these benefits are unique to music, as opposed to, say, sports or painting? Or could it be that people who go into music were already smarter to begin with? Neuroscientists have explored these issues, but so far, they have found that the artistic and aesthetic aspects of learning to play a musical instrument are different from any other activity studied, including other arts. And several randomized studies of participants who showed the same levels of cognitive function and neural processing at the start found that those who were exposed to a period of music learning showed enhancement in multiple brain areas compared to the others. This recent research about the mental benefits of playing music has advanced our understanding of mental function, revealing the inner rhythms and complex interplay that make up the amazing orchestra of our brain. Please let me know if you have any sort of questions or uh, anything absolutely that you want. There's a question. Do people who play music have more emotional intelligence? That's very interesting. Well, I, I can't say for sure, uh, but uh, in, in, in the video they mentioned that uh, uh, the, some, some some of the of the of the subjects in some of those trials exhibited uh, a higher emotional response to some uh, uh, general uh, situations, that, hypothetical situations that they were placed into. Uh, so it could be. How can you tell which side of your brain is dominant? Uh, well, mm -hmm. technically, 
it goes, uh, it's uh, the inverse of uh, the hand uh, that you, for example, if you're right handed, uh, more than 95% your dominant hemisphere is the left one. If you are left handed, uh, most probably the dominant hemisphere is your right one. They are cross, cross coupled. And can you change it? So, for example, if you find maths tricky, is it a lot of it about practice and making connections between? Oh, yeah, it is. It yeah. is practice. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the dominant hemisphere cannot be changed, uh, but uh, through the processes of neuronal development that we talked in the beginning, uh, you can strengthen certain areas by essentially weakening some others. So, yeah, practice essentially it's, it's correct. Practice makes perfect. What about people that are ambidextrous and can use both hands? Will they still have a dominant half? Uh, from what I know, uh, ambidextrous people, uh, they are ambidextrous because both of their hemispheres are dominant. So they do not have, may, maybe uh, one might be slightly more dominant, but uh, I think they uh, are both uh, equally, equally dominant in most of the cases. How did they find out which law was which? Okay, this is a very good question. And uh, I will just uh, type in the chat, uh, it's called the Penrose hum uh, Humunculus. They found out which law was which through trial and error. Like the, the cases of uh, Broca and Wernicke with people having brain damage, there are several other people around the world with several other types of damage in different areas. And then there are some scientists who this is exactly what they do. They delineate, they take the input uh, from the clinicians and then they, I mean, like a hundred years ago or so, because now we have amazing technology and we can just uh, visualize everything. Uh, but this is how it developed through, through um, the, the processing of the information relating to different patients having different types of brain damage and they could associate uh, function with uh, function loss. What does the right side of the brain, why does the right side of the brain control the opposite side? This is a very good uh, question. Uh, this uh, can only be answered through a, uh, developmental biology question. Eh? Essentially, the, the current uh, answer is that uh, the, the, it is the way the fetus uh, is positioned inside the, the mother's belly and uh, it's more time efficient for the brain to have cross, uh, cross uh, functional, uh, cross uh, relationship rather than having the linear like right, right, left, left. Uh, you would have to talk to a neurodevelopmental uh, biologist or something for this question. The final question, how does the brain react to singing uh, the same way it reacts to the same person playing an instrument? Uh, yes, if, if you uh, sing, not empirically, but if you are actually uh, trained uh, with, uh, uh, how's it called, uh, with the uh, notes uh, and um, you are uh, doing solfege and all that stuff, uh, then definitely singing is sort of like an instrument. So yes.